This is CBC Saturday News. Good evening, I'm Maravel Tarouk. With less than two days left before the federal election, party leaders are in key battlegrounds trying to sell their message to voters. But Conservative leader Andrew Scheer had a hard time doing that today. He faced hard questions related to a report about a smear campaign against another leader. Ashley Burke has the details. On a critical day, just 48 hours before the election, Andrew Scheer faced a barrage of questions from media about a new controversy. Why can't you be transparent about that? A source told CBC News the Conservatives were behind a negative social media campaign to seek and destroy the People's Party of Canada and keep its leader, Maxime Bernier, out of the federal leaders' debates. Former Liberal strategist and critic of Justin Trudeau, Warren Kinsella, and his consulting firm worked on it. The firm set up a Twitter account under the branding of an anti-racism group. The goal, to push Bernier and his party to defend hate speech and racist comments. Have you and or your party hired Warren Kinsella's firm to do anything this election campaign? So as a rule, we don't make comments on vendors that we may or may not have uh, have contracts with. Oh, or may why? Not have. Is it we, a rule you just made up? We like, just, just don't, just we don't make, make comments sense. on uh, contracts that we may or may not have or vendors that we may or may not have, uh, have engaged with. Sheer repeated that same line more than a dozen times. If Liberal leader Justin Trudeau had said that, would you be would you accept that answer? It's uh, we don't we don't make comment on contracts that we may or may not have. Thank Thanks very much, everyone. Merci beaucoup. Warren Kinsella is a professional mud slinger. The target of all of this called it a professional smear campaign. Andrew Scheer is ready to say and do anything to gain power. He is ready to steal the election with lies and manipulations. On the campaign trail, Scheer's opponents were asked about it. The Conservatives have had to use the politics of fear and division and indeed just make stuff up uh, in order to try and get their message across. So with, with respect to you know, having um, the plan to subvert another party paid for by another party, that seems all very troubling. The People's Party of Canada is now turning to the Commissioner of Elections Canada to investigate all on the crucial last days before the election when Canadians are making up their minds about who to vote for. Ashley Burke, CBC News, Ottawa. And as voters gear up to head to the polls, some are still undecided, while others already know what name they're ticking off on the ballot. We went out to get a sense of what issues are on voters' minds as the campaigning winds down. What do you think's going to happen? I don't know. It's a tight race. Yeah. I'm not sure. To be honest with you, not sure. I just had to vote to make my, my voice. That's it. <laughs> my biggest thing was just, like, Trudeau's climate plan and how sheer his lack of one. I think they should talk more about the economy and how they should focus on it. I think my biggest issue is actually the environment. Yeah, um, I think right now, like, you know, since the UN where that girl talked about the environment, everybody trying to bring that issue up, but they don't have a plan for it. So I want them to have a more tangible plan for the environment. While some big names are throwing their support behind the federal leaders, the CBC's Yelena Adzik explains what that means for the election. Celebrity style endorsements for political candidates seem to be more the norm for U.S. elections. But as we gear up for a Canadian election, the star power is in play. NDP leader Jagmeet Singh recently dished about how he slid into Rihanna's DMs on Instagram, where the two exchanged messages of support. And he also released this video as an endorsement from Drake's music producer, Noah Forty Shabib. What's up, everybody? I'm here with, I can't even imagine that I'm saying these words, but I'm here with 40, Jinder, Modern Day Maharaja, 40, y'all know, incredible producer, mm -hmm. magical music, genius. Other celebs releasing videos include Pamela Anderson, who threw her social media influence behind the Green Party. I like about the Green Party, they don't get into these smear campaigns attacking people's character. They talk about the issues that are important. Now, one star who went above and beyond an endorsement for the Conservative Party is Juno-winning country music star George Canyon. Canyon decided to actually run as a candidate in the riding of Central Nova. Then there's actor Ryan Reynolds. He shared this nature-friendly pic with his close to 15 million Twitter followers to let them know he's, quote, proud of the climate progress made the last four years, strongly hinting at support for Trudeau's liberals. 
Now, comedy host of Full Frontal, Samantha B, and producer of that show, Alana Harkin, they posted this video as comedians from Canada who are clear on who they don't want us to vote for. Take 30 minutes to vote so that the entire country doesn't lose health care and same-sex marriage. So the big question is, will these strategies work at the ballot box? Dr. Peter Chow White, a communications expert from Simon Fraser University, had this to say, quote, Ryan Reynolds, he's very funny and an actor. Rihanna is a singer, and I'm sure they're very smart and thoughtful people. But how many followers translate to voters? You have to look at who votes. It's well known that youthful voters vote the least of everybody. Sounds like a clarion call to fresh-eyed Canadian voters to make their mark on Monday. Yelena Adzik, CBC News, Toronto. Residents who live on Woodbine Avenue are fed up with the number of accidents on what they call a dangerous stretch of their street, where Lakeshore turns into Woodbine. They say drivers, some who are impaired, are speeding and hitting parked cars and houses. The latest crash just last night has residents speaking out again, demanding change. Angelina King reports. This is the third time John Beals's car has been hit while parked along a small stretch of Woodbine Avenue. Right in front of the truck here, my company vehicle was hit. And just a little forward, again, hit. I parked my car across the street hoping to avoid this situation, but it's unavoidable. The latest incident happened early this morning. Police say a van struck the guardrail, then hit a hydro pole, slid into oncoming traffic before hitting two parked cars. It's a complete write-off. The All three wheels have been torn apart. A 23-year-old man has been charged with impaired driving. The next morning cleanup, now a familiar sight in the neighborhood. Residents say this pole being repaired today was just replaced after a vehicle hit the same guardrail and pole last month. Plenty of residents have stories and photos of numerous accidents over the years. Erica Faulkner's car was totaled in May. People just let a rip and, uh, and I worry because my son's school is just a block over. It's a huge issue and um, I think it should be taken care of. Their neighbours agree. With the frequency of these accidents and uh, the constant speeding that goes on here, it just does seem that one day somebody is going to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. There have been four crashes at this bend since January. Residents have been calling for traffic calming measures, even starting a petition in May. The city councillor says he feels their frustration, but says because this is an arterial road, it's more complicated. Some people have suggested rumble strips. That's not something the city is currently permitted to do. So I'll be asking um, the province uh, to take a look at that. Bradford says additional signs and enforcement have been put in place, but says it's not enough. He says he's been waiting on possible alternatives like enhanced lighting or painting the barriers. Is more needs to be done and it needs to be done now. Residents hope something is done before it gets worse. Angelina King, CBC News, Toronto. Residents around Oro Medonte love the natural beauty, peace and tranquility of Lake Simcoe. It's why they bought homes there in the first place. What they didn't anticipate is the noise and other problems that would come from their neighbors' homes, many that are now short-term rentals. Philip Lee Shannock headed up there to check things out. Not just out for an autumn stroll, this retired school teacher and her husband are trying to protect their community from behavior you wouldn't expect in a quiet rural setting. They had brought prostitutes in and were against the garage just taking turns. She had a, how do you deal with that? They say a handful of homes on the street have been converted into party palaces. The former member of town council is worried these commercial ghost hotels rented off home sharing apps will bring big city problems. This is a small, Ontario community. This is not a big city. We're not used to having a lifestyle that is lacking in morals and mores. It's just not what we do. So far, the couple have collected more than 700 signatures on a petition, demanding a ban on short-term rentals in residential areas to prevent noise and other nuisances. It's the same natural beauty and charm that's bringing more and more short-term renters up here as well. It's within a short drive of the city and more options like Airbnb are making it an affordable experience for many. 
and renting luxury homes on the shores of Lake Simcoe has become a lucrative business for many. This operator says the problems have been exaggerated. I don't understand why would you go through all this trouble just because of the one, two, three bad apples when you can just deal with them directly. She says her family is very strict about who they rent to and opposes any new rules that would restrict responsible renting. So I do believe that everyone should be still held accountable if if there is a if if a guest or a homeowner whoever right if they break um, the noise bylaw or any other bylaw really that's set in the township I believe someone should be held accountable a guest and the homeowner who let them in so that's something that we believe in strongly. But others say short-term rentals are breaking zoning bylaws. Okay so I understand that that there are very good short-term rental operators there's no question but these are commercial uses in residential neighborhoods and it prime fundamentally puts them in conflict. Pressnell would like to see his local council do what Blue Mountain and Collingwood have done, ban short-term rentals from residential areas, because more homes could become de facto hotels next door as more visitors flock to their corner of paradise. Philip Shannock, CBC News, Aura Medante. Two men are injured after they were struck by an alleged impaired driver while standing on a sidewalk in Etobicoke. It happened in a residential area near Martin Grove and Steeles at around 3 a.m. Police say a female driver mounted the curb and drove along the grass before hitting the men. She remained on scene and is facing impaired driving charges. Both men were taken to hospital with non-life-threatening injuries. Well, the Toronto Scotiabank Marathon isn't until tomorrow, but road closures in the area are well underway. Bay Street is closed from Queen to Dundas, along with side streets in the area. Hagerman Street, Elizabeth and Albert Streets are closed as well, and James Street is closed from Queen to Albert. These closures will be in effect until 8 p.m. tomorrow. So let's check in with Marta to see what kind of weather we're looking at for those thousands of runners who are turning up for tomorrow, Marta. Well, it's going to be a beautiful day, but let's take a look at the current systems across the country. Not much really happening here. I mean, you see a high pressure area, which is responsible for that beautiful weather that we're going to see in Ontario, especially for that marathon. It's going to be this warm weather as it comes through this next system that's coming through. It's going to be that high pressure area that protects Ontario. And tomorrow, I mean, overnight, seven degrees by the afternoon, it's going to be 16 degrees. So well above seasonal for this time of year, it should be 12. So we're getting that nice little treat to the heat. And again, for the Toronto Marathon, it's going to be a very nice day, just a little bit of cloud, but for the most part, sunny. And now we're looking at Saturday overnight into Sunday, this front pushing through. But again, as I mentioned, that high pressure area really protecting Southern Ontario and there's not much really happening for Sunday. Taking a look at the temperatures, as I mentioned, 16 in Toronto, 17 in Guelph, 17 in Hamilton. So really pushing those temperatures could reach up to 20 in some areas. And on Monday, it's still really nice as well, starting off the work week with that high pressure area protecting much of the GTA, including Toronto at 16 degrees. I'll tell you a little bit of more when you can see the rain a little bit later in the show. OK, we'll see you then. Thanks, Marta. Good news for fans of Spicy P. Pascal Siakam has reportedly agreed to a four-year max contract extension with the Toronto Raptors. Reports say the deal is worth $130 million. The Raptors had until Monday to agree to a new deal or Siakam would have become a restricted free agent in the summer of 2020. Siakam won the NBA's Most Improved Player Award last season and played an instrumental role in the Raptors' championship run. Toronto opens the season at Scotiabank Arena this Tuesday against the New Orleans Pelicans. Celebrating 10 years of eating, the World Poutine Eating Championship took place this afternoon at Young Dundas Square. Eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Stop eating, stop. Oh boy. Okay, there he is, Joey Chestnut, taking the win, eating. 28 pounds of poutine in 10 minutes. He is currently the top ranked eater in the world. Congrats, Joey. We'll be right back. You're watching CBC Saturday News.
there are reports of skirmishes between a Turkish-controlled militia and Kurdish forces in northern Syria today. But for the most part, the five-day U.S.-brokered ceasefire seems to be holding. The question now is, for how long? Stephen D'Souza has the latest. In the city of Kobani, Syrian army soldiers joined the Kurdish-led Syrian Democratic Forces to bolster their front lines. No sign here of a retreat that was supposed to be a part of the U.S. brokered ceasefire. In case of any attack on Kobani, we will stand together to defend the border, this Kurdish soldier says. Kurdish forces have given no indication that they'll leave. Civilians, too, tell one journalist in the region they're not going anywhere. What they have told me that uh, it's our neighborhood, it's our city, we, we grow up here, so we have to stay here um, as a civilians, like to protect uh, our family, to protect our house and, and the neighborhood. Both sides accuse the other of breaking the ceasefire. Turkey says Kurdish forces launched 14 attacks in border cities like Ras Alin, Tal Abyad, and Tal Tamir. But Kurdish forces say in Ras Alin, in Kobani, they were defending themselves against attacks by the Turkish army and militant groups fighting for Turkey. In Tal Abyad, Turkish aid groups handed out supplies to civilians amidst reports the fighting had quieted down today. In Ras Alin, other aid groups say they were able to gain access to deliver aid and evacuate the wounded. They managed to evacuate like around 37 wounded uh, from fighters and civilians from inside the city. Uh, they were in the siege by the Turkish army and the other factions. Meanwhile, Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan addressed supporters today, warning what will happen if Kurdish fighters don't leave before the ceasefire expires. If it works, it works, he says. If it doesn't, the minute 120 hours expire, we will continue from where we left off and keep crushing the heads of the terrorists. What happens next is a matter of much concern on the ground. Erdogan already has a meeting set up the day the ceasefire expires. But he won't be planning the next steps with the Kurds or the Americans, but with a new regional power broker, Russia. Stephen D'Souza, CBC News, New York. It was an extraordinary day in the UK Parliament. Prime Minister Boris Johnson was trying to get support for his new Brexit deal with the EU. But Parliament ended up voting to push the deadline further. Farmer Morali reports on the day's developments. Order! It was a rare but raucous weekend sitting of the British Parliament, the first time MPs met on a Saturday in 37 years. Point of order, Mr. Ian Blackford. Dubbed Super Saturday, it was supposed to be the day lawmakers voted on Prime Minister Boris Johnson's new deal to leave the EU, but instead, a legislative curveball. The eyes to the right, 322. The nose to the left, 306. MPs voted instead to approve an amendment, one that holds off on approving any deal until lawmakers have passed all necessary legislation for a smooth exit. The purpose of the amendment, as has been said in several interventions and speeches, is to keep in place the insurance policy provided by the Benn Act, which prevents us from crashing out automatically if there is no deal in place by the 31st of October. Outside Parliament, anti-Brexiters, also known as the People's Vote protesters, marched the streets of central London. As news of the vote reached the crowds, a celebration erupted. But you can't ignore this many people. Whatever nonsense is going on in the Palace of Westminster today, we the people need to give our opinion on it. And for me, that means stay in Europe for the sake of my children. Today's vote is a huge blow to Boris Johnson, who for months has insisted, no matter what, the UK will leave on the 31st of October. According to the law, the Prime Minister must now go back to the EU to ask for a delay. I will not negotiate a delay with the EU. And neither, and, and, and neither does the law compel me to do so. The Speaker of the House will now decide whether Johnson can put his deal to another vote next week. I will reflect on it and give what I hope is a fully considered ruling on this matter. That decision is expected on Monday, just 10 days before the looming October 31st deadline. Farah Morali, CBC News, Toronto. 
A new art installation has popped up in the distillery district. The giant thinking emoji is asking visitors what it means to be you in today's digital world. It's meant to draw awareness to the Age of You exhibit at the Museum of Contemporary Art. The emoji will be popping up in unexpected locations around the city, ending at the MoCA on October 26th. We'll be right back. Thousands of gamers flocked to the Metro Toronto Convention Centre today for a weekend of tournaments, cosplay, panels and more at the nation's largest video game expo. This show is amazing because I, I'm a gamer myself. I love playing video games and being at a gamer con like this, it's, it's a dream come true. What do you like about video games? Um, they're fun to play, I guess. Yeah, they're really yeah. enjoyable, you know, an aspect of escapism that allows you to live a different world for a little bit and then come back to reality. I think the overwhelming community and just being able to, there's so many different things you can try. I like video games because it's kind of like a good thing that you can relax from. Like if you come home from a stressful day at school, you just come home and you're chilling. You know, you get to play some video games, say Fortnite, Call of Duty, whatever you want. They're fun. <laughs> at the end of the day, I play video games to have a ton of fun, so. And I always did, they never fail to, uh, to succeed in doing that. Martin, my favorite one out of there was uh, after a stressful day at school. 
<laughs> like to come home and play some video games. You know what? Those guys should go outside because the last couple of days of nice weather, oh. I'm not saying it's going to be bad, but it is going to be rainy coming up. So they might want to head outside, especially uh, tomorrow. Let's just look at the systems right now, Saturday. You can see that high pressure. It's really uh, keeping the rain out of Ontario um, for Sunday and Monday. But on Sunday, 16 degrees, as you mentioned earlier in the show, we have the marathon, the Scotiabank Marathon. So it's going to be a beautiful day for them. And it's above seasonal, 16 degrees which for this time of year is normally around 12 but look at the GTA those temperatures are looking fairly nice for majority of the areas Guelph 17 degrees Toronto 16 Hamilton 16 some areas could reach up to 20 so it could be the last 20 degrees we see uh, before you know it gets much cooler but that's for Sunday taking a closer look at the GTA now there is a Wyoming low that's forming and of course that means that it originates over Wyoming and it's targeting the Great Lakes early in the week it's going to be bringing much of that rain into the shores of Lake Superior and more into northwestern Ontario, but it will have some effects on uh, areas like Toronto. So we can see that system pushing through, bringing that rain, and just look at that front. It's cutting through Toronto as well, so there will be that chance of rain in through Tuesday. Much of those showers throughout, and you can see that in Ontario here, that rain icon throughout. Perry Sound with rain, Toronto with rain 15, London with that chance of showers, and a quick look at the seven-day forecast for Toronto. Tuesday and then on Thursday as well we have that chance of rain. We'll enjoy the clear skies while we've got them. Thanks Marta. And that's our show for you tonight. Thanks for watching. Have yourselves a great night everyone.